Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 6, Network Address Translation for IPv4. So, Network Address Translation, commonly referred to as NAT. In this video, we're looking at NAT characteristics, types of NAT, advantages, disadvantages, and then static dynamic PAT, and we're gonna end with NAT for IPv6. So, essentially, what are some of the main characteristics of NAT? So, private addresses came into effect a, a while ago. Those are going to be non-routable addresses. They're not allowed on the internet. For class A network, it's uh, 10 through 10.255.255.255, or it's a 10 uh, with a slash 8 with slash notation. For class B, it's going to be a 172.16 through 172.31 and everything in between. The network range is going to be 172.16.00 the slash 12. Lastly is a class C network, which is 192.168.0.0 and pretty much anything in that range. So if it starts with 192.168, that's a class C private address. And again, the network range is going to be 192.168.0.0 slash 16. So why does that matter? Well, when we're talking about NAT, the purpose of NAT is essentially to take all of our private address spaces and allow them the ability to get on the internet. And we do that through the network address translation because the purpose of NAT is to provide the translation between private addresses to a public address. And so what I mean by that is, here we have an internal private address. Let's say this is your house, this is your business, whatever, it doesn't really matter. In order for your addresses to get on the internet, they have to go through a NAT router. So the NAT router will actually translate any internal address to a internet capable address. If you're at your uh, home, you may only have one IP address and they use different mechanisms to make sure that each of the home devices can get on the internet. If you're in a business setting, you may have multiple public addresses and each of those public addresses are allowed uh, inside access to certain resources. It really just depends on how they are configured. So, again, NAT allows us to take a private address space and convert it to a publicly accessible resource. It allows it to gain access to the internet. Normally, NAT is done on a stub network. Stub network is just a clever way of saying it's a network that contains itself and it's kind of more like an end-based network. There are no, are no networks that connect through this private address space. And again, the important part here is it's going to mask all of the internal private IP addresses so they are allowed on the internet. So how does NAT work? So let's assume PC1 wants to communicate with the server. Well, the issue is PC1 has a private address, so it won't be allowed on the internet. So PC1 will send a packet address to the web server to the default gateway. Default gateway will forward it appropriately. We're going to assume that this guy right here, R2, is the NAT router. So this is actually our internet device. So R2 will receive the packet and read the source IPv4 address to determine if it needs translation or not. This is going to be something that's internet capable, so it knows that private IPs aren't allowed on the internet. So if it knows the private address spaces, it will determine that it is not allowed. Thus, it will need to be uh, translated to a private address. So R2 will add mapping to the local to the, uh, from the local address to the global address to the NAT table. So 
what we'll have is we have our local internal. That's going to be the source IPv4 address. That's going to be changed to our inside global address. That's going to be the temporary address that we're going to be using to be able to send that data. R2 will send the packet with the translated source address towards the destination. The destination, you'll notice destination is still going to be the same and our destination still is going to be the same. So the outside local and outside global is essentially just saying the destination. So R2 will send the packet with the translated source towards the destination. The web server will respond with a packet address to the inside global address because basically as the packet flows out of R2, the IPv4 source address is now changed to the inside global public address. So that means for all intents and purposes, all returning packets will have the inside global address or the public IP for address. So the web server will respond with the inside global address. R2 receives the packet with the destination address. R2 will check the appropriate NAT table and then we'll do the correction and we'll change it from the inside global to the inside local and then forward it appropriately. This is something that your home router does automatically that without any setup. At home, you may end up with a, a network that has like 192.168 or a TIN network. Well, when you go on the internet, what ends up happening is all of your addresses will actually be translated to your inside global address. That is why if you go and you Google what is my IP address from any device on your internal network, they're all going to have the same IP address. It's not that each device has that same address. It's just you are actually looking at your global address that the router is showing from the Internet's perspective. So terminology, you need to understand inside local, inside global, outside local, outside global. Inside address, that's going to be the device being translated. The outside address is going to be the address of the destination. The local address is the local address and any address that appears on the inside portion of the network. And then our global address is going to be the global address and the address that appears on the outside portion of the network. We have our inside local. In this example, we have our internal uh, address, the YN2168.10.10. Our inside global address, this will be the source address after it leaves the router. So here is our router. Net, it's going to be happening. So our inside local, source address, destination address, our, sorry, source address, destination address, and then this is going to be as it comes back. So our source address is going to be going to our web server. After NAT, our source address will be changed from the inside local to the inside global and keeping it to the same destination. The destination address doesn't change. Even though it may say outside local and outside global, you're going to notice the destination address in this example are the exact same. That's going to be sending it to the web server. The web server will respond the web server now becomes the source address. That's still the outside global address. As it comes in, it will be sent to the inside global address. The router will receive the packet using the appropriate inside global address. The router will look at its NAT table and will translate that back to the appropriate inside local address still keeping the outside local address as the source, but the destination is changing from the inside global to the inside local, showing the appropriate internal network. That way, there is a specific flow of that traffic that the router has to map. If the router happens to be restarted 
all of these connections are terminated. So the NAT table is stored in memory, and when the uh, device is restarted, all the information of that is lost. All right, so what are some of the types of NATs? Well, there is static NAT. Uh, essentially, NAT is going to be more of like a one-to-one -one mapping. You can say anything coming on this public IP address forward to this internal address. That is a one-to-one -one type NAT. You can have dynamic NAT, and that's essentially you have an inside global address pool, and it's pretty much first come, first serve. And as you have internal resources that need access to the internet, they will leave and they will just uh, temporarily use a public IP address. There is no real mapping, but that does mean that it does require enough public addresses to satisfy all of the users that are connecting. For example, if you have five public IP addresses and you have six things trying to access the internet, well, only five of them will work. So dynamic netting is kind of uh, not always the, uh, the better option. It's not always scalable. So what's interesting is after dynamic net, we have what's called PAT, Port Address Translation. And what PAT does is it does a single public IP address, but it starts looking at an appending source port numbers. We've already talked about port numbers in previous videos. The source port number really doesn't matter uh, as, it, as it relates to the destination port number. If you're trying to access a web page, you're trying to access the destination's port 443. What port number it's coming from isn't really relevant. So with PAT, we can actually uh, take the source port number, and that is what we use to review different content uh, and separate that different content. The nice thing is PAT is pretty, uh, pretty common nowadays. So PAT will actually use uh, randomized ports, but it tries to do inside uh, port numbers and they try to keep them pretty uniform. And you'll notice we have what's called an overload. And normally, what we'll do is we'll look at the first assigned port number starting from the beginning of the appropriate port groups, like 0 through 511, 511 through uh, 1023, or 1023 through 65, 535. These will help slowly figure out what port numbers to use. When there are no more port numbers available, there is more than one external address to the address pool. Pat will move to the next address space to, or the next port pool to actually hand out those ports. Realistically, I've never had to go into that much detail. Essentially, it will look through the port numbers it has available and it will use them to just temporarily assign so that we can link the damn individual sessions. So here we have 10.11 and 10.12. Both of these are trying to access the internet. So to make sure they are kept separate, the NAT router will actually designate two different port numbers and inside the router will have a NAT table that says anything responding on port 1444. And again, that's just a temporary port. That will actually be mapped internally to this address. Anything responding to this port number will respond to this guy. And that way we can have one public address with multiple devices. And this is, again, one of the more common options. We're going to look at how to configure all of these in our lab videos, and those are coming up next. So let's look at a comparison. So if we were doing an inside global and inside local, we've already talked about that. However, with our PATs, essentially it's the same thing except we're adding port numbers instead. So we have our inside global address, which is really our public address. We have our inside local, which is our private. Here we have our private, but we're again tacking on the port numbers so we can make sure that this channel is using the correct port and that port is being forwarded to the correct internal address. NAT is more one-to-one. -one. Well, 
that's not realistic when you only have one public IP address. So Pat will use global address mapping using port numbers. With NAT, it only uses IPv4 addresses. With PAT, it's addresses and port numbers. With NAT, it does use a unique inside global address. Again, that's going to be how many public addresses you have. Problem with that is, if you don't have several public addresses, then this doesn't work. With PAT, you only need one public address. So packets without a layer 4 segment, essentially, because some packets do not contain a layer 4 port number, for example, ICMPv4. Each of these message protocols is handled differently uh, by PAT. For example, the query message, echo request, echo reply, will include a query ID. So ICMP4 will use the query ID to identify any of the echo requests with its corresponding echo replies. So even though it won't use port numbers, it will use something inside of that protocol to link the two. We have a packet tracer investigating that operations. So let's talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages of NAT, NAT conserves public addresses, conserves application port level using multiplexing, increases flexibility in public network spaces, it does allow for private addresses to coexist, and NAT will hide IPv4 addresses inside the network and will translate it to a public address. Disadvantage. NAT will hide an inside pub, uh, private address and will map it to a public address. That means visibility end-to-end -end does not exist. So end-to-end -end traceability isn't there. End-to-end -end addressing isn't there. NAT will also increase forwarding delays based on the equipment. So some of these negatives, well, it all depends on the lens you're looking at. If we are looking at the lens of security, that's not always a negative, but when we're talking, we're wanting end-to-end -end connectivity, then that could be a challenge. So it really just depends on the lens when we're looking at the pros and cons. So let's talk about our static NAT. Let's talk about our NAT types a little bit more in depth. First one again, static NAT. Static NAT is a one-to-one -one NAT. I've used both the combination dynamic and one-to-one -one NATing so that I can have a web server uh, inside my network. And I can do a one-to-one uh, -one map so that anything coming in on this IP address forward to my web server. Anything coming in on my second public address then forward appropriately and because that would not be tied to a one-to-one -one NAT. So you can use them in conjunction. You can use them multiple ways. You don't have to decide one or the other. You can do it multiple ways. So how do we configure this? Well, first of all, we set up our mapping. We do our mappings by going to the global configuration mode, type IP NAT inside, source, static, that will be the inside local address and that will be the inside global address. This is the inside address, this is the outside address. So when things come into this address, forward to that address. We still have to again do our IP NAT inside and we're setting the source to a static address. That's step one. Step two, we need to actually assign what are our inside and outside interfaces? So here we have IP NAT inside. That's going to be attached to the interface on the inside part of the network. IP NAT outside will be the outside going towards the outside portion of the network. Packets coming from the internet will have to come in from the outside. We have to denote which is inside which is outside so that we know where to actually apply this rule. We apply this rule on the outside side. Outside will be looking and listening for that address. If this address comes in on the inside, it will be ignored. So how do we analyze this? We've already looked at source and destination addresses. We've already looked at understanding the flow of that traffic.
So again, you just have to logically work through the hop by hop looking at the frame from source, the default gateway, default gateway to the internet, to the destination, and back. How do we verify? We can do a show IP net translate and it will show the inside and inside and outside addresses, inside global, inside local, outside local, and outside global. After a session has been created, then it will actually uh, populate all of the tables. The first one, we've not actually received a packet back from our response. When we do receive a response, you will now then see our outside local and outside global addresses being populated. We can also do a show IP NAT statistic if we want to see uh, how many hits and how many misses are being shown. If we want to clear them, we can do a clear IP NAT statistic. We have a lab configuring static NAT and verification. Dynamic NAT is our next one. Dynamic NAT, like we said, we use a pool of addresses. However, the pool has to be as large as how many addresses we have. So dynamic uh, NAT will use mapping inside local to inside global addresses. The NAT, you'll use a pool of addresses. If we use all of the global addresses, then the uh, next sending device will have to wait until there is a open address. If all the addresses in the pool are used, again, waiting has to occur. How do we configure this? Well, we're configuring a pool of addresses now. So step one, to find the pool, we will do an IP NAT. We will use the pool command. We name the pool and we give it the source. We'll give it the um, starting range, end range, and the appropriate network mask. We will also then provide a access list. The access list will allow us to filter what addresses can use this pool. And then we will set our IP NAT statement. So IP NAT inside source, we're listing, provide the name of the ACL and provide the pool and the pool name. That will say, this is the matching addresses that can use this pool. That way you can dissem uh, disseminate which one is going to be allowed and which one will not be allowed. Uh, it's binding the ACL for use with the pool list. And again, we have to identify which is inside, which is outside interfaces. How do we analyze? The exact same process. We walk through it logically, looking at source address, destination address, for our addresses as they flow. And we should make sure that we can understand the logic as they return. And how do we verify? Show IP translate. We can also do a verbose option. If we do a show IP translate verbose, we get a little bit more detail. And again, we always have our show uh, IP net translate. We have our clear command, and we can also look at our statistics. And that way our statistics will show what is being allowed, what's being allocated, total addresses being used, if there's misses. And lastly, we can always look at our show command, our show run command, to look at uh, what is happening in the show run. And again, we have a lab verifying and walking through dynamic nets. Pat is our next big one. And again, PAT is port address translation. And this one is probably going to be the one that you really need to pay the most attention to. I, I've used static NAT and PAT the most, and I normally use them in conjunction with one another. We'll be setting up an IP NAT inside source, setting up the appropriate ACL, but this time we're giving it an interface and we're also issuing an overload command. The overload basically says we're allowed to overload how many addresses we have. We may only have one public address, but we're going to overload that public address with multiple ports. We create the ACL, 
realistically create the ACL first, then do the uh, NAT table, but everyone's slightly different. And again, make sure that you identify which is inside and which is outside interfaces according to NATs. So once we've done that, and we've also uh, set up our overload, we can uh, ensure that our ACL is there, and we can start translating. How do we analyze? Again, we walk through the logical process, but this time pay attention to the port numbers. Normally, we're look, gonna be looking at the source port number as it leaves the original source because that's going to be a randomized port number that will be used to identify the inside local address. Again, when it is responding back from a web server, for example, the web server is probably going to be responding from port 80, and that means the new destination port will be the appropriate destination port that would be matching from the original source, if that makes sense. So. Here's our original source. On our return trip, it's gonna be looking at whatever is our destination port, and that will let us know which one of our communication strings it is attached to. And again, we walk through the exact same thing. We analyze two different strings with our paths. Verification, show IP NAT translate. We can do our statistics as well. And again, we have a packet tracer walking us through how to configure it for verification. So lastly is NAT64. You can use NAT for IPv6. It will use a unique local address, a ULA, but since IPv6 doesn't include its own IPv6 private address spaces, it's kind of a little bit more difficult. That's why it will use the ULAs. IPv4 has a different purpose. So with our IPv6 ULAs, these are meant for only local communication. So ULAs really aren't meant to be provided additional IPv6 address spaces. But it does provide protocol translation between IPv4 and IPv6, and that is what's known as our NAT64. And so what we can do is we can translate from an IPv4 packet to an IPv6 packet using address spacing. Though that's outside the scope of this course, it's one of those things that you should know how to do just in case you do actually have to translate between an IPv4 network and an IPv6 network. And that is it for this chapter. We have several labs configuring static, dynamic, and PAT forms of NATs. We talked about purpose of NAT, pros and cons of NAT, uh, functions of NAT, pool addresses, how ACLs are used, and how to verify. If there's any questions, please reach out. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.